you get on this phone? Who are you? Lay flat on the floor immediately. What the, what the hell are you talking about? Pull down now. Two seconds. In my eyes, Previs is the, it's the building block of the filmmaking process. They can come from any sort of process, either a virtual camera system or just sitting behind a computer animating or taking storyboards and modeling off of the storyboards and composing your shots based on that, to, in which you drive the creative and the story of a film, as well, as well as figuring out all technical implications and um, any other you know, budgetary you know, things that come into play. So you can figure it out up front and in the end you save a lot of money. Define with the director and the producers what are the critical sequences to previous first. Some of them are critical because you're trying to plan how you're going to shoot it. Some of them are critical because you want to get to a budget quickly and you need to give the people who are bidding the show previous so they really can understand what you're trying to do. Um, and sometimes you brush stuff ahead of other stuff because you want to sell it to the studio and you use previs to sell a sequence or the whole movie to a studio. Primary responsibilities is to uh, is to help pe help the director's vision come to life by taking the script, the comments from the director, the, the director's vision and input from the different blessed department heads on the show and create moving pictures basically. Previs to me it's, it's really exploration of story, you know? And, and um, you know, a lot of times you, you look at uh, previous companies and the work that they do and they show, here's what our previous looks like, <coughs> and here's the film, and it almost looks exactly the same, where I think the strength in previous is everything before that, that we can really quickly iterate through whatever it is you know, and say, well, it's not about like, you know, getting down to the final decision as much as like, well, these are bad decisions. Like, you can do it a hundred times, a hundred different ways, but we can define for you the 80 ways that you probably shouldn't do it because it's not the strongest way to do it. So in a way, it's almost like sculpting and, you know, it doesn't cost as much as sitting on set, you know, burning film and having all these people there and you can just explore story. Previs is all about collaboration. We think of ourselves as a hub in the production process, much like the old studio system. The old studio system, everything was on the lot from costumes to props to sets um, and every, all the people that you needed to make a film were all on the lot ready to go. Today, all those people are freelancers that come in from different places and they work on many different shows at different different studios all the time. So we find that Previs is a good way for everybody to get their ideas into a single pot. You know, and, and another strength I think of Previs is the fact that, you know, you're in a studio system where, you know, someone's got to approve the money, you know, and a lot of times, you know, if the Previs is there, it's there to back up the, the idea, you know, so you, you could be there and you could say, hey, you know, we can do the sequence in a million bucks, but then there's this shot. It's really expensive, but you know you can see it in context as previs, and you know you can sit there at a table with a bunch of executives, and they can make the call and say, well, you know what, the shot's worth it, you know, because mm. it's a big part of the story. We can look at a previs and dissect it and break it down because we can give them any level of detail. We can show them the computer files. We can break down how many feet a camera's moving. We can break down the distance to your subject, the height off the ground, what lens is being used. There's a lot there that you can actually use to create a final image that is going to be extremely accurate to what the final product is going to be. So you don't end up coming up with ideas that just simply cannot be shot. Well, you work on the previous, you bring it along with the director, and at a certain point you lock it down, you say, okay, this is what the sequence is, and then of course you have to shoot the movie. Sometimes the sequence winds up very much like the previous, and sometimes it doesn't. Ah! 
some some directors are really really involved with the process. They want to be there on the like right behind you on the computer. Or you know, if we have a virtual camera system, which is a uh, you know, it's basically a handheld screen which is driven by motion capture, in which you get real time feedback of your environment with you know lens accuracy and everything. You know, some directors want to shoot with that. Um, I was on Avatar for four years as well, and being on Avatar, you know, Jim Cameron, he wanted full control of all of it. Um, other directors, like some commercial directors, we won't even see them. You know, we'll work directly with uh, the visual effects uh, supervisor just to get you know the visual effects down. So when it goes to the, vi uh, the visual effects uh, studio, you know they know how much it's going to cost them in the end. They know what lens they're going to use. They know what motion control system they're going to have to use, and we provide like the motion data if we need to. So that's it, it, it ranges. It's, it's such a big range. As you can kind of see, you know, we take these, uh, you know, all of this stuff, and you know, this is this is a pre-built scene basically in the 3D world, and, you know, and we can ma manipulate it and do whatever we want to with it. So, you know, basically, as you have your, you know, your characters, you want to adjust them in timing. You know, if you know at any given time we have an operator on the stage, you know, we can tell him, you know, I want a platform, you know, and you know, be on a train moving 200 miles per hour. So we'll get the background moving and everything for free, and we just shoot on the train as we're going, you know. So it's a uh, yeah, it's a great tool. And then, you know, the, the best part about it is it's real time. So, you know, let's say we're capturing and I say hit record. So, and I'm getting a shot right now. We have our play controls basically lined up here. One of those are buttons that we sort of pre-programmed. So, you know, if you just find your spot, there's a bad guy. And go in. It's really such a new technology. There's not a lot of people using it. You know, it's sort of growth out of Avatar, and you know, it's starting to catch on. It's just, a, it's just a really fast way to make movies. You know, this is basically solving everything from the cameras and taking all the data from the cameras. And this is the program that basically envelopes all of that data. And what this program then does is it outputs the motion in a way that Motion Builder can understand it. And so, in turn, we get it's basically like. All of this is communicating routed through this way and then back to here. So it's just camera to optic track to motion builder to camera back to motion builder. Here at Halon, uh, all of our supervisors edit their own sequences. We do not have uh, we don't have editors employed or on staff. Um, I am a big proponent of this technique because I feel that understanding how shots to go, go together make for a more efficient sequence supervisor. Uh, also, it's a great way to understand what revisions need to be made, how things are, not, are or are not working, and having a global understanding of how the editorial process works really impacts dramatically your understanding of how to design shots. We're looking at now films that take two, three years to make. You know, they're really expensive. They get to the, the houses like ILM and Noeta and they take them, you know, six months, a year to come back. Yeah. And meanwhile, as a director, you're cutting this film. And you need to make sense of it editorially. You know, the sound guy needs to make sense of it editorially so they can do stuff. And, you know, previs is there to cut in. You know, and that's what we call post is here, where you have your plates that you shoot, right? Where they've got, for example, it's a guy running around in a green environment. And there's supposed to be all sorts of stuff there, monsters, all that stuff. And it, but it takes like six months to a year to come back from the post, post house, you know? Where, you know, where post is, it's great, is we can do that real quickly in a day or two. You know, I mean, it's not going to look final, but it'll be there, and the context is there, and the story is there.
there are all kinds of previs. Mm -hmm. uh, for the bear fight on, in Golden Compass, our previs was really what you would call previs, we called final animation. And that was because we had to have the little girl riding the bear. Mm. And we had to build a motion rig that she would ride on that would move like the bear was walking or running. So we animated it to a final level um, as previs. So the bear was fully rigged. Uh, and in the meantime, we were building the mechanical part of it. And we exported that, those motion files to the motion control equipment, control the camera and the rig, put the girl on the rig, shot her on that rig, and then of course did on-stage composites very quickly to double check and make sure it was all working fine, which it was. real-time virtual studio system called Prevision, and it's made to do real-time keying, tracking, rendering, and compositing of CGI and live-action scenes all together while on a soundstage. Generally, what's, what happens is that people who have been shooting visual effects work are frequently, uh, it's difficult because you're staring at a huge field of green, and one person will have one picture in, one, in their mind, another person will have a different picture, and you don't find out that everybody was thinking something different until four weeks later when it's too late, right? This way, everybody gets to see the same image at the same time, and the creative decisions get, you know, controlled by the director of photography and the director on stage. So for tracking, we have a combination of tracking technologies. We have a little InnoSense camera here. It's an optical tracking that looks up, and as soon as we can see four targets at once, we can lock to them. And that way we can figure out exactly where we are in space. So we also found we needed much more angular accuracy because it turns out that, uh, similar to the Steadicam principles, very small amounts of angular deviation show up as a very big change in the background. So we built a very high accuracy gyro called the AirTrack. And so we take that data between the, this camera and the AirTrack, the position and the rotation, fuse them together, and that's what lets us know exactly where we are anywhere on the soundstage. The next step in the, in the, in the shot is to get a good key. So as you can really see, we're getting a very good quality um, high, def high definition key that we're keying the full 1920 by 1080 HD resolution real time and we can do it very very quickly. The provision system is where everything comes together. We have a breakout box module that brings in a number of the signals and does some signal processing and then the video and the data etc all go into prevision and prevision it has the software has it's a software hardware system uh, that combines the real time keying, tracking, rendering, compositing etc and essentially what you're looking at is a visual effects pipeline running in real time. And, and so all the, the basic uh, things that you have in traditional visual effects, there's essentially a panel here for each one of them. One of the interesting things about it is we found to really solve the CGI problem, live action match, is we had to do very accurate lens distortion. So you'll see that the buildings at the edge bow outward slightly. And that's because they're experiencing barrel distortion to match the lens. As we zoom in, the buildings will straighten out. Mm. And then as I zoom in further, they will exhibit pincushion distortion. And all these are basic behaviors of zoom lenses as they're going through their range of motion. And all these are derived from our, our real world lens calibration system. Well, what's especially interesting is being able to see that real-time composite on the stage means that you can match the lighting very, very well. And the, the biggest problem, or one of the key difficulties in visual effects is making sure the lighting of the foreground and the background match. And if you don't have a reference there, it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. You'll have the light pointing the wrong way, or it'll be the wrong color, etc. When you've got an Im a real-time image, then you can the lighting can be matched extremely quickly. The business has, is in two areas. One is in the more onset pre-visualization area and data recording, which is more more the higher cost episodic and the feature film area, where they're using the system to provide an onset preview, recording all the data and using that to accelerate their post-production process. And one of the things that's happening is that traditionally there's been you know, very separate areas. You'd have pre-visualization, you have onset, and you have post-production. 
And what frequently happens is people make the movie three times, and sometimes the assets don't, don't transfer over. Mm -hmm. What we're working very hard to do is to make it a more seamless flow. So you take the assets you create in the pre-visualization world, we can load them into pre-vision, shoot with them on stage so you have real-time reference. You know, if you planned a shot, you know exactly where everything is. That tracking data then goes and flows through to post-production. And that way you don't have you know, redundant effort. The complexity of what's happening now in the motion pictures is that all these complicated worlds that have been separate up till now, motion capture and visual effects and the camera team and these, this, that and the other and backgrounds, have all operated in slightly isolated worlds because they weren't all working at the same time. You'd have camera was shooting, backgrounds would be built before, etc. and every group had a very you know, defined area. What's happening now is that all the technologies are being put together at the same time. You have motion capture on stage, you have robotic camera systems that are controlling the stereoscopic you know, controls of that. You have multiple very complicated cameras operating around, you have visual effects teams, mm -hmm. and it all has to, you have to keep track of all that. And so what we build is a system where all the data flow can come together, and so instead of having to look at a lot of separate data flows and hope they all come together, you just look at the image, and that way you see where you're at. And that's, that ends up being, uh, I think, for a visual world, the best way to look at something is to, by making an image. You know, DBs that don't like previs, you know, but I think I, you know, and I think that's a valid concern sometimes, you know, because if you have the wrong, it's, it's a personality matchup at the same time, you know, because like, you know, you don't want to be the previs guy that tries to make their own movie, you know, I mean, we're not, we're not, we're not directing this movie. My first things I want to do is meet the DP and let him know that I'm there for him. And I want to let him know that, you know, I'm not there to take his job because he's there, he's, he's there for a reason. And I'm not there to do is to make any falls. So um, that's just the first thing I want to do with him. And I want to provide the DP with everything he needs. So when he gets out there with the camera, he knows exactly where to put it and do whatever he wants. And if he wants to get creative out there as a director, then yeah, you know, that's great. All more power to him. But um, that's like, definitely never we would want to take anything away from the DP, you know. But I have seen some DPs where, they get a little precautious because they don't really understand the process that much of what we do. A lot of the times when I when I start a film, um, there's just nobody hired. It'll be just me and the producers and the directors, or the director. So there's really no DP to even talk to. One of the best things about previews is, and this is the one thing that DPs are starting to learn now, is DPs at first or a little frightened by it because they were seeing it as telling them what they had to do. Yeah. But instead what the previs is telling them is this is really how the director wants, this is shorthand for the director telling the DP how he wants the sequence to play. And within that, if you approach filmmaking like you would approach playing jazz, there is a structure to the music that you don't mess around with. But you can improvise over the top of that like crazy. And that's what previous is great for. It's great for establishing the structure and the flow of the scene. And then you can come back when you're shooting the movie and you can improvise on that structure. That it is so difficult to figure that out on the fly on the set that you'd better know ahead of time what it is you need to do. There's a lot of directors that, you know, already have their boards and so it's really a close relationship where it's like here's the sequence and you work with them you know to kind of sculpt what that sequence is you know so it's a, it's a you know to talk with the director and, and what his views are uh, and you kind of like just just get like a mental download of, of what they're thinking of <laughs>
at times gets a bad rap because people say that it's creating um, sort of lazy filmmaking. It's like you can have everything you want, and so you want everything, and so you put everything in. But it can also have the reverse impact on that as well. You start to see that things are too crazy, or things are not, you know, the timing's not right, or whatever. And so uh, it gives you the opportunity to start solving a lot of these problems before you go out and shoot. So I think it, it, it does create a bit of a different aesthetic because you can create, you can do anything in your mind can come up with today. But, um, but I think that probably would have happened anyway with visual effects. As soon as you start to manipulate the camera in ways that are, that diverge from common film language, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you are toying with how the shot will resonate with the audience. Because it will, will, it will have, uh, if it is truly a fabricated move, it will have a sense of unreality to it. Sometimes I find that if people try to follow the previous so specifically that they're not allowing themselves to be inspired by what's happening on the set on the day, then you know they're not using all the tools available to them. Uh, there really is no segmentation between pre-production, production, post-production. On a lot of big films, those three concepts have been condensed into one. The visual effects supervisor will start very early on in the process now, and they'll keep the DP on all the way through to the end of the show now, because it's important that everybody's voice is heard throughout that process. Um, digital tools, pre-visualization, post-production, all these different things are sort of being done all simultaneously now. You know, all these different things are overlapping now, and with the ability to shoot digitally and do rough compositions right on set, you know, the idea that production needs to be segmented into these different things is kind of going away. You're finding that there really is only one thing now, and that's production. Thank you.